Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's nine o'clock, so time to start. My name is uh, Thomas Hedenbark. I'm group CEO of Fastems. We are in Finnish factory automation specialists um, and one of our most important markets is here in, in, in North America. Uh, the title of my speech today is uh, Agile Manufacturing, how to produce a lot size of one economically. And uh, the short version of that is rely on the automation from Fastems. <laughs> but since I have uh, about 45 minutes to elaborate on this subject, I will give you a little bit more of background uh, on that subject. Um, so we are, we are a leading provider of um, automation systems for metalworking machine shops around the world. And our claim is that we're bringing manufacturing into the future. And bringing manufacturing into the future has very much to do with automation, robotization, digitalization, all those sort of big buzzwords and trends of today. And we are in the midst of, of that. Our uh, footprint looks like this. We have two factories uh, and the headquarters, as I said, in Finland, in a very industrial city um, about 200 kilometers north of our capital, Helsinki. The city is called Tampere. I'm pretty sure that nobody of you has heard about Tampere before, but now you see it on the map. We have a second factory in, in Germany, northern part of Germany, close to Düsseldorf. And then we have sales and service entities uh, serving the, the main markets that we are addressing. So the map pretty much tells you where automation business is progressing today. And even if um, uh, there is only one dot in China, in Shanghai at the moment, uh, in our view, uh, China is the, the biggest market for automation in the future. I will elaborate a little bit on that as well in, uh, in my speech. Um, some facts and figures, we are an open integrator, so we are not connected to any of the technology providers, but we work with, with all the different brands and makes of uh, machine tools, especially, but also industrial robots and other auxiliary equipment uh, in, many, in the manufacturing domain. Uh, we have, um, in fact, worked with uh, some 90 different brands of machine tools over, over the history of uh, Fastems in, in flexible manufacturing systems. The first flexible manufacturing system uh, from Fastems was installed in 1982. And as a, as a small uh, detail, curiosity, this system is still up and running. It has been modernized, of course, several times uh, over the years, but uh, it's still up and running. Uh, we have a 24-7 worldwide technical support, which is very much relying on remote uh, diagnostics and remote monitoring. In fact, 93% of all incidents reported by our customers can be solved remotely without a service technician having to go to the customer site. Uh, so either we intervene in the system remotely, or we give uh, our customer the necessary um, instructions and advice. Um, then in the right lower corner, you see our logo with the numbers 8760. Anybody has, uh, has a guess on what those numbers stand for? Yes. Normally, uh, this is about the percentage of audience that knows that or can figure it out. Um, so 8760, it's the number of hours in the year and it's, uh, it's sort of uh, the, the very, very core of our uh, value proposition. So we provide solutions which enable the customer to run his expensive equipment a maximum of those 
uh, eight available hours, and we support that with the necessary service uh, to make sure that that uh, the equipment and system is up and running. Uh, the record uh, number uh, achieved by by one of our customers is uh, is 8,200 uh, hours spindle hours uh, of the year. Um, it's uh, I would say very very challenging to get any higher than that because you you would have maintenance stops and and such that you still still have to um, to provide and of course it is it goes without saying that a, a large part of those hours have been unmanned hours so uh, lights out production mm. Then a picture which is sort of an um, illustration of the kind of uh, equipment, the kind of systems that we deliver to our, our customers. So you would, you would see here in the upper part a, a full range, uh, range of flexible manufacturing systems with several machine tools um, connected with uh, loading, unloading uh, stations with a, a gantry type uh, automa automated tool storage serving the machines with uh, robotic loading cells and such. So very sophisticated mechanical uh, equipment and judging from this picture you would think that Fastums is a mechanical engineering company. At core this is of course true but when one considers that 70% uh, of our engineering hours are software development and software production, then one could as well claim that we are a software company with mechanical engineering attached. Uh, and in fact, uh, when you look at it a little bit closer, the software is really where the value add is created for our customers. The, the software that connects the shop floor equipment with your upper level uh, systems like the ERP systems, the CAD CAM systems uh, in the office. But it's the combination of those three things that I, I have mentioned before. So you have the automation hardware, you have manufacturing management software that we have developed and, and, and provide, and you have the life cycle services that goes with that. With that, you, you sort of have the full package of the automation solutions uh, of Fastums and the package that can provide a maximum uh, production of the, out of those eight uh, 8,760 hours of the year. Uh, before we sort of approach the more technical uh, uh, content of my speech, I would like to uh, elaborate a little bit on the big picture. Uh, what we are talking about here today is agile digital transformation. So it's, a, it's about the transformation of of the industry, of companies, of organizations towards digital. Some of that disruptive, some of that incremental steps, but the transformation is inevitable. To frame that a little bit, um, this first picture here, it comes from a, a study published by uh, Sloan uh, Review at the M MIT uh, about two years ago. Uh, they, the researchers looked at digital maturity in different sectors, uh, so about the strategic approach, the capabilities related to digitalization, and, uh, and uh, sort of covering everything that, ha that would measure the maturity of an organization in terms of digital. It's not very surprising that at the top of this, uh, this ranking you have IT, technology, telecommunication, entertainment industries that sort of uh, I think anybody would uh, would sort of intuitively figure out but it is fairly interesting and maybe even shocking to see that manufacturing is on the on the last uh, third place in this ranking uh, the only sectors uh, less developed and less mature would be the public sector not very surprising and then construction and real estate industries but being on the third last place in this ranking uh, definitely uh, should trigger thought and, and also the process towards, towards changing uh, this situation. 
Um, then I, I picked something from another study, a very recent one. This was published by McKinsey, uh, world's biggest consultancy company, uh, early this year. They had looked at what automation potential is available with technology already existing today. They looked at 43 major economies of the, of the world, uh, and of course the USA being one of those. So what, what, is, what are the jobs that can be automated with technology already available a day, today? In fact, they can come, come up with a shocking number of 51% of the working hours in the USA can be automated with technology already existing today. And you, you can see the categories uh, that, that fall under, under, uh, under that frame. So it's work where you collect data, where you process data, or you do predictable physical things. All those can be automated with technology already available today. It's a huge number, 51%, and the dollars attached to that uh, number uh, uh, those are huge as well, so almost three trillion uh, dollars of uh, salary cost. If, um, if we then, uh, I thought, I, yeah. Uh, if we look at the worldwide number um, out of the same study, in the middle you have a pie chart which, uh, uh, which tells about the full-time equivalent, so 1.2 billion jobs can be automated. One-third of those are in China. Uh, and uh, one about, if we look at the sort of big industrialized uh, developed areas, Japan, US, and, uh, and Europe, uh, they, they would cover, uh, well, a little bit more than, than 10%. I think it's about 12% 12, 12 of those numbers of FT. So, so almost... 400 million uh, Chinese jobs can be automated. Uh, if you look at the dollars, again, of course, the portion of China is then lower because the labor cost is, is of course, lower. And uh, the US, Europe, and Japan, they here present about 25% of the potential savings. Again, reminder, with technology already available today. Um, so my take on this picture is that there are two types of drivers. There is a driver uh, called demographic development. This is something very relevant for China. And the other one is simply the business case. Because with the, uh, with the saving potential that you have uh, through automation, uh, the, the business case simply will be so attractive that companies and organizations move that direction. The demographic thing, again, is that uh, in China, due to the one-child policy um, there, the working population is, is shrinking at, at an alarming speed. And the only way to compensate for less work, if you want to maintain the same growth of GDP, is by increasing the productivity. Because in, in GDP, you only have these two things. It's amount of work and the productivity, productivity of the work. So inevitably, <coughs> automation will be a huge uh, trend and boost in, in China. So that was my claim from, from earlier. Then um, some words on how digitalization would progress in industry and manufacturing. Uh, this is uh, from a study published by World Economic Forum uh, about two years ago. So they they come out up with a with a, a concept which uh, says that digitalization will progress in four waves. The first one being focusing on operational efficiency, so asset use utilization, cost reduction, productivity of work, um, and those are the kind of things that most companies, most organizations are addressing and, uh, and, uh, and uh, tackling with the help of automation. Uh, all of those are good and important things, but they are not really uh, radically changing business models 
uh, or the, the reality of companies. Uh, that comes with, uh, with data monetization, utilizing data to develop valuable services. And um, we sort of see ourselves as being on that, uh, in, in that wave as, as Fastems. Um, then come the more developed uh, versions, outcome economy and uh, ecosystem economy, which are uh, still to be, see, to be developed in the manufacturing domain. Um, now coming uh, a little bit closer to, to the Fastems um, approach and, um, and our uh, everyday life. When we started uh, our digital journey or transformation towards digital and agile, um, we very early on realized that to transform a company, par partially quite radically, you need a, a cultural fra framework to support that. And that was the first step um, we did, developing our own company culture. It goes beyond just um, defining the values of the company. This one becomes a lot more tangible because be behind each of those three pillars, uh, we have a set of very sort of down-to-earth, uh, real-life uh, descriptions on behavior, the wanted behavior of, uh, of our organization, of our people. Just a short uh, description of that. Backbone, it's pretty evident that's about integrity. Uh, we Finns are known to be very sort of uh, honest, straightforward people, sometimes to the extent that one could think that we are almost a little bit stupid to be that, that blue-eyed and trusting other people because we expect them to be like we are. But integrity is the first one. The sharing, caring part here is about uh, interaction and communication. Um, so both inside the company and outside the company with our suppliers, with our customers and other stakeholders. Uh, and the third one has to do with uh, striving for excellence uh, continuous improvement, water is water, rock is rock, uh, is a story which comes from, from Korea. In fact, um, one of the most famous Buddhist monasteries uh, in, in uh, South Korea has a, has a 30 meter high bronze gold-plated statue. That's the one thing it's famous for. The other thing is that there, there was a monk living in this monastery who holds the world record in meditation. He meditated eight years in a row, and when he stood up from his corner, he spoke those words. So the association to continuous improvement and striving for excellence is that the real challenge is to find the simple, hard truth and core. It is very easy to make things complex, but to make things simple is the real challenge. So that's, that's a, the cultural framework. Um, after having defined the, the culture uh, together with uh, or involving all our employees, we took a next step uh, in developing our leadership concept. Uh, so this is, these are the principles according to which leadership is defined and the manners that are attached to those principles. I give you the sort of a short version of this. Uh, in my view and based on my experience from more than 35 years of, of Managerial and, managerial and leadership uh, positions is that the, the most important element of leadership is that it's about enabling other to, others to succeed. You create a framework, you choose the right people for, for the right job, you give them the, the trust to, to uh, develop and to use their creativity and their potential. Uh, that's about enabling success. And if others are su successful around you, then you are, of course, successful yourself. The second uh, thing is something that we very often forget. You, as, uh, in the hectic day, daily life, it's, uh, it's very easy to sort of uh, uh, focus on action and operations only, but you should give yourself enough time to understand the big picture. And in understanding the big, big picture, working outside in trying to understand the customer needs and what is happening outside your organization. 
Um, another important and very uh, powerful element is the explaining the why. Because if you are able to explain the why, then you don't need to put too much, much emphasis on uh, explaining what and how. Those sort of can be delegated to the experts and managers in the, in the organization. And the third one, creating and maintaining a sense of urgency. Uh, very typically, organizations are good at developing plans and strategies, uh, maybe even action plans, but very often you sort of uh, drop the action before you have really reached the ultimate goal and, and result that you were aiming for. The, the title of our leadership concept is Delight and Deliver. Uh, that comes from the thought that uh, man managing and leading organizations and people, it's always about motivating uh, and creating enthusiasm, getting people to, to uh, get committed and uh, dedicated to their task. So that's the de delight part. The deliver part is about the purpose of doing or being. It's only the result that counts at the end. It, Nobody gives you credit for having worked hard or done your best. It's the result that counts. So that's, uh, that's the leadership concept. So those two form, form the framework in which we operate and develop our, our solutions, our organization, and uh, the growth that we are uh, aiming for. Then a, a few words on um, the nature of innovation in the digital era. My claim is that Innovation in the digital era is disruptive. If I would ask you, what do those three things have to do with, it, with each other? So you have Uber, you have a smartphone, you have Oral-B, the world biggest manufacturer of uh, electric toothbrushes, uh, part of the Procter Gamble group. Anybody has a guess? Hmm? Well, on the first glance, there is nothing that you would sort of think of what combines an electrical toothbrush with mobility. That's true, but there is a digital connection, in fact. Again. They have disrupted, yes. But now the combination of the two. So the story is the following. The modern toothbrushes they have a Bluetooth connection, and you are sort of uh, encouraged to put the, the Oral-B app on your phone. Well, it tells you that you brush your teeth properly and that you should change the brush head regularly. Very sort of rudimentary, simple thing. But it's, it's a little bit of a digitali digitalization of a, a basic product like a toothbrush. But when you then realize that brushing your teeth connected to an intelligent device you start generating data. And in fact, processing this, this data shows that 17 minutes after you finish brushing your teeth, you will need transportation to get you to the office, to the airport, to the train. Well, that's where the connection to Uber comes. But that's not all. What does Uber do with this data? They can aggregate from a given area the mobility need at the certain moment of time and by doing that they can guide the necessary capacity to that area and capture the, the biggest possible market share of that mobility need. And suddenly toothbrush and mobility are connected but nothing that would be sort of evident. The story doesn't tell how these two organizations found each other and found this ut utilization possibility of data generated by a toothbrush. But my sort of take or what I would sort of uh, advise companies to do is sort of try to find your electrical toothbrush. Where is data generated that can be valuable for you? And uh, the disruptiveness of this, I think, is it's evident. Uh, by the way, uh, Googling will not uh, give you this story, but it is a real life story. I didn't come up with it. It's too wild to, for anybody to come up with. Um, so that's about disruptiveness of innovation. Now, getting closer to, to um, production, uh, our claim is that 
complexity grows in production. You have smaller lot sizes, you have shorter life cycles, the variety of products is increasing, you have more and more demand for personalized products, or you make it a thing that gives you a competitive edge. Uh, the clock speed of business is increasing rapidly, there are shifts in technology that you have to tackle, and there, is, there are shifts in business models that you have to tackle. And there is the, the ever uh, further developing globalization that you need to, to address. So those are just a, a few items to sort of underline that, that complexity grows, and it grows rapidly in production. So manufacturing companies are faced with a set of challenges that need to be addressed and tackled. Our view on this is that the growing complexity of production can only be met by increasing the level of automation and digitalization, uh, which together then cre creates, create a basis for what we call AMS, Agile Manufacturing Systems. And I will have a few case examples on, the, on those um, in a minute. Um, there was a survey um, made by McKinsey earlier this year um, they covered more than 1,000 organizations and, and uh, asked especially upper management and executives about the trends of the future um, and how organizations are transforming and developing. Mm, so continuous learning is becoming a, a reality and, and paradigm. Uh, cultur cultural change is needed to develop the workforce of the future, so sort of linking to what I described from the Fastems world before. There is a strong shift towards cross-functional collaboration and team-based work and uh, traditional hierarchies that are known for stability. They will be more and more replaced by agile organizations that have both stability and dynamism. And uh, rapid learning and fast decision making will be more and more uh, uh, themes of the everyday life in companies. So uh, those sort of frame why we uh, move towards and why we see increasingly um, a need for, for agile manufacturing systems and what, what they could look like and also how they then link to the title of my speech, the lot size one economically. Um, start with this one. Uh, this is a, a rather sort of generic example it's a um, robotized deburring cell, finishing cell, uh, which can be a standalone cell um, to do these kind of operations. But uh, in our case, very often, uh, they are co uh, this is a cell that is connected to a full, full range flexible manufacturing system. Uh, the system uh, displayed here has uh, a, uh, a large uh, tool storage and automatic tool change uh, for the robot arm. Um, the, when connected to an FMS system, uh, you would have automatic loading and, and unloading of the workpiece. And uh, when it's connected to a, to a flexible manufacturing system, you avoid additional fixtures and clamping operations for the workpiece. So a very, very highly productive uh, addition to this kind of, of systems. And uh, even if our heritage and history uh, links very strongly to, uh, to pellet automation in the flexible manufacturing systems, uh, we, are, we have also uh, collected over the years uh, a, a broad expertise in, uh, in working on the workpiece itself, especially in the area, area of, of deburring, polishing, uh, linishing, and, and such operations, which link very closely to, to the uh, machining and, uh, that is managed by, by the, uh, the flexible manufacturing system. We have, um, uh, for, this, for a standalone system, we have a software uh, edition called the Fast Wizard, which uh, controls uh, the cell, uh, and uh, also a uh, product which 
which can then or enables you to do offline programming. When connected to a full-scale um, FMS system, the control would be uh, done by our manufacturing management system, the MMS software uh, family. So that's a, that's a first example uh, of a, a cell which, which supports uh, smaller lot size production. Then a second approach. Um, here we have a, what we call a robotic FMS. So it's a flexible manufacturing system, but it doesn't have a stacker crane and a, and a, and a storage uh, attached to it. Uh, but rather you have, a, you have a robot on tracks which uh, serves the purpose of, of uh, transporting the pallets and, and handling work pieces. Um, the, the customer in this case is um, manufacturing airplane structural parts, aluminum parts. Um, in fact, uh, the, the biggest single industry that we serve is the aerospace industry. Uh, but all mechanical engineering industries basically belong to our customer, customer base and customer range. It's just that aerospace has become over the past 15 years of, of a very sort of important industry that we serve. So in, in this case, the, uh, the customer is, is uh, manufacturring airplane structure parts in aluminum. Uh, there is automatic loading uh, to the automated clamping fixtures uh, that's on the, on the right end of this, of this picture. Uh, here in this case, uh, rather high volumes are produced. Uh, one speciality of this system is that you see on the left side an AGV. Uh, and the AGV in this application is um, used to manage uh, uh, tools. So you have, a, you have a, a tool storage attached to the system and the AGV then transports tools for maintenance and brings back the, uh, the maintained uh, and uh, documented uh, tools into the system. Uh, our um, MMS manufacturing uh, management system software manages the complete, uh, the complete system as a uh, intermediate layer between the ERP system, the CAT, CAT system, which is, which is sort of in the office, and then the resources which are on the shop floor. Um, the, the part of the system which has uh, which is on a, on a sort of green floor that's an extension which will uh, will be delivered uh, soon to to the to connect to the system um, with that extension we will then also have deburring washing and cmm uh, included in this uh, in this total system well I, I think it goes without saying that here we have a, a very complex application very advanced application uh, but with all those different technologies and, uh, and uh, applications, our, our software is able to control the full system. Uh, our, our software can be described as a uh, manufacturing execution uh, software, but a very specialized one uh, in this case, so for machining operations and managing Inter interfaces, especially to, to machine tools. Um, the next example, um, in this case, um, well, this, this, this one is fairly similar in terms of functionality to the previous one that I displayed. The main difference is that uh, the customer in this case uh, is manufacturing uh, oil and gas uh, industry parts, so very huge valves and pumps. Uh, so if the, the payload in the previous system was sort of around 200 kilos, sorry I'm from Europe so I, I only know the metric system, but 200 kilos, uh, in this case uh, the payload uh, can be up to 6,000 kilos. Uh, in fact it's 5,000 in, 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 in real life but the capacity goes up to, to 6,000 kilo. Um, Again, here is a tool automation included uh, based on a gantry, uh, gantry served 
uh, storage. Uh, we have fixtures automatically loaded, um, uh, and and uh, there is an AGV uh, system attached to this, which in this case uh, is handling the material in f in feed and out feed. As in the previous system, it was handling the tools, washing, CMM in included, and at later stage also sandblasting. Um, then um, a system which um, um, which has um, well this is uh, this is uh, around a grinding process and uh, one of the one of the advanced features here is that uh, the workpiece positioning on the on the pallet and the fixture is me measured before the processing and uh, and then uh, again measured so so you, you record uh, the offsets and you do an offset correction based on that first measurement then measuring measuring after the grinding uh, process that gives you then correction factors that are fed back into the process so that you are improving and and optimizing the accuracy of the process uh, and basically with this you are avoiding scrap parts completely and it goes without saying that uh, is, it's about grinding that here we are talking about very, very close tolerances that, uh, that need to be produced by this system and this is achieved by the, the, the procedure that I just, just described. Um, again, um, very advanced in terms of the mechanics, mechanical engineering part of this, but especially the software layer is of, of uh, <coughs> crucial importance here. Uh, the next one is um, a system where we are basically in the uh, lot size one production. Uh, so it's, um, in this case, the customer is producing um, uh, industrial gearboxes and uh, the machining here is, is, uh, is a turning operation. So here we are automating turning machines, so no pallets involved. And we are handling uh, the, the parts directly uh, and also using the robotic, robotics to, uh, to manage the chucks and to adjust chuck jaws uh, so that, that we have a an adaptable, agile system here. Um, one piece of production, and uh, in this case, you, you, you can see the, there is a gantry uh, connecting the machines. There is, a, uh, there is a Cardex storage system for materials, tools, and chuck jaws, which is integrated into the system. And again, the upper level control of this, uh, of this complex uh, production line is uh, made by, uh, by our uh, manufacturing management system, uh, control system. Um, the, 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 this system produces uh, 80 different parts, but as I said, in a lot size of one, so you can imagine the the, the demands of uh, of managing uh, the uh, the variability of of parts uh, in in such a system. Um, the last case uh, that I have here, and this is a, a manufacturer of bearing rings for the air, for an aerospace application. And this, uh, this has similarities with the, the previous one. Again, it's a, it's a one-piece lot uh, size production line. Um, it differs from the previous one in that we here are handling both parts and pallets. So the machining, of course, would, would be done with the workpiece on 
uh, on pallets. And then the grinding and the finishing operations, again, uh, are done with robots handling the workpiece and uh, without uh, the pallet. And <clears throat> similar to the previous case, the robot, uh, robots are handling or the robot is handling also the adaptive changes that need to be made on the, uh, on, uh, inside the, the equipment. Um, process steps, so there is, there is uh, machining, there is uh, uh, grinding, deburring, uh, measurement and, and uh, marking uh, with laser uh, involved here. And um, we have delivered one so far of this, but there will be a multitude of, of similar uh, systems uh, de delivered to the, to the same customer. Those would be my, uh, my six case examples, and uh, you, you would have noticed that um, when coming towards, uh, towards the, the two last ones, we were sort of getting closer and closer to the one lot size um, approach. And uh, all these cases uh, are of fairly high complexity. Of course, we collected them just to impress you. But of course, uh, depending on your specific need, also uh, simpler solutions uh, are uh, possible and available. Uh, but always the, the sort of connecting element is really the, the software that I've mentioned several times. So to uh, conclude my, um, my speech and coming back to, to the digital transformation, agile trans transformation. Um, our thoughts on this is that the transformation is, is not just about technology and business models. Those play an important role, but so do culture, leadership, and performance management. So it's a combination of those four which drive companies and organizations forward in the digital era and, and in, in transforming your businesses, both in manufacturing and in your business models uh, going forward. I thank you for your attention and close with the 8760 key to your success. Thank you for your attention. Now, if there are questions from the audience, I would try to uh, answer them. I'm only the CEO of the company, so I'm not really the in-depth expert. We, are, we, of course, have our booth here at the, at the trade show, and we have David Suica, who is our CEO here in, in the US, uh, who can probably go a little bit deeper than I can, but uh, above all, he can connect you with our experts who are here at the trade show. But you, you had a question. Uh, Absolutely, absolutely. So our uh, range of offering is really very broad and it starts with, with fairly sort of standardized configurable products which we call FPC, mm, uh, flexible uh, uh, pallet containers that you can uh, connect one machine but you can also extend them to several machines. You, you have full fa functionality of FMS but uh, with sort of certain limitations in the capabilities and of course the price tag is, uh, is a much more affordable one. So that's, that's a, one way of, of, of entering this. Um, that's, that's in the FMS uh, domain. But the, the similar applies to robotics. We have robotic solutions which are uh, sort of fairly, uh, fairly standardized and, and, and more, more configurable. Um, you would find at our booth uh, an example of that, which is a, a product that is distributed through a, through a partner of ours, but it, is, it has been developed and manufactured by us. It's, it's a product which, which is a very, very uh, sort of plug and play, easy way to start automating, especially lathes. Uh, so if you have the opportunity, take a look uh, at our booth. But definitely 
we have we have so many examples over the years of of job shops, smaller companies that have uh, started with sort of baby steps, when, and then when getting into automation and being able to to extend. Um, uh, a, a, a thought that relates to this is that uh, very often uh, automation is sort of perceived as a job killer. And of course, the purpose of automation is to, uh, to eliminate manual work, uh, sort of lower, lower level work in, uh, on the shop floor. But if, if, I, if we look at the big picture of what, have hap what has happened at our customers that have been uh, introducing our solutions, uh, they are typically, and, and in an aggregated picture especially, they are employing more people than they did before because they have improved their competitiveness and created a, a very fa favorable situation to compete in the markets and be successful and thus increasing their workforce. Of course, the, the workforce that you need and require for automation has a higher qualification level, but you need much less of that workforce. And uh, we, are, we, we have so many tremendous examples of companies that have completely turned around their, their uh, situation by using automation and, and working with FASTEMS. So absolutely no, no uh, reason why a smaller company should not be looking at this. Um, I hope my uh, examples were not sort of too frightening, but uh, yes, we have the sort of entry level solutions as well. Please. So, so the question was uh, some numbers on what what uh, what is the magnitude of the of the changes that relate to to both labor and and uh, productivity and, and such. Um, it, it's it's very difficult to give a generic answer uh, on that. Also, also payback time, uh, because that that really depends very much on the on the situation that you are uh, addressing. But a very typical number is thirty percent productivity increase. But then you would look at, at other things like uh, huge reduction of work in process, which then will liberate uh, working capital. So there is efficiency in that sense. Uh, very often also it's a, it's a footprint issue. So you would liberate square, square feet in your factory and increase the, the, the efficiency uh, per, per square feet. So that enables you to, to grow your production um, remarkably. Uh, uh, within the same sort of walls. Um, I, I visited uh, on Monday one of, uh, one of our, uh, our very, very impressive customers here in the, in the Chicago metropolitan area. Era, uh, area. Uh, in this case, uh, over the past five years, the starting position was uh, about 120 standalone uh, milling centers and uh, about 180 people operating those. Uh, today, the same production is done with six advanced machines connected to our FMS systems, and the, the workforce is less than half, so it's 80 is the headcount today. Uh, at the same time, the revenues have doubled. So really tremendous figures. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to go for such bold steps, but, but in this case it has absol absolutely paid off and the story continues because the, uh, the competitiveness of, uh, of the company has improved in such a remarkable way. But uh, as I said, uh, the, the numbers are um, generic numbers, uh, specific numbers would always, always be sort of depending on the case. Um, the CEO of this company, in fact, uh, when I met him um, earlier this year, uh, he told me that he's very annoyed with his CFO who always wants to hear uh, ROI calculations and numbers from him. Uh, for him, this is not relevant because he, he knows that he does the, the right thing when investing in automation. So he doesn't really need those calculations. Then, of course, you, you would have banks and others that, that need those numbers. But, but uh, intuition 
and sort of based on your past knowledge and, and experience, you, you can uh, continue also, also without those ROIs. Yes, please.